One year ago, we helped create these meadows, and now they are booming with life. And we've done so to help the most graceful, the most ethereal of all insects, the butterfly. There is no insect as beloved as the colorful and vibrant butterfly. Ancient Egyptians put them on their tombs. Van Gogh used them as a symbol of hope. And these days, Taylor Swift seems to like them as well. They are universally loved across time. However, they are seemingly more of a cultural afterthought because we've been eradicating them from our landscapes by destroying their main habitat, which is of course, meadows. So with this project, we are trying to fight this trend by helping create a kind of Noah's Ark meadow that can help stabilize the free-falling butterfly populations so that they can still be around when eventually public consciousness finally catches up and decides to do something about this at scale. I think this project really embodies this um, rewilding pragmatism because it can't always be returning to a 10,000 year old landscape full of large herbivores and large carnivores. This year is about bringing back an agro-pastoral landscape from the last 500 years. And that is really important as well because there's a lot of species that have gotten used to these habitats that are rapidly diminishing and that really, really need help. So in this video today, I want to introduce you to the complex world of meadow ecosystems. I want to show you the progress that we have made with this project in its first year and go on a butterfly hunt to see how many species we can find in our meadows in one afternoon. Let's start by rolling back time and figuring out why these habitats actually exist. You see, meadows and the species that rely on them evolved in a very different landscape that had two crucial components, fire and large herb. Fires can temporarily clear the landscape of woody vegetation and allow for meadows to flourish in the disturbed areas. And large herbivores, such as bison, aurochs, or even mammoths, would open up large areas through their browsing and grazing behavior. As human populations spread and the herbivore megafauna became less common, these meadows could be expected to decline, but they actually managed to stick around because, as it turns out, we were pretty good grazers ourselves. Well, not us directly, but the animals we herded. The Pleistocene landscape was slowly replaced by a more familiar landscape of small-scale herding and eventually farming. And it turned out that we were actually a decent substitute for mammoths when it came to this job. We created open areas by clearing forests for grazing and maintained them through mowing and controlled burning. We tilled the earth, compacting some areas while aerating others and effectively maintaining that mosaic of habitats where biodiversity flourishes. And that is more or less how the landscape was right up until the 20th century, when we arrived at what I've previously described as a cabbage Armageddon. And in our project area here, this first manifested itself through the Soviet Union. Collectivization, crop standardization, and the technical modernization drastically reduced the diversity of farming practices and shattered the habitat mosaic. I don't think I've ever seen monoculture crop fields as big as the ones that still exist today in Slovakia. But there's no point complaining about the past, because we can actually complain a lot about the present. One could dedicate a video to explaining how the EU common agricultural policy is a disaster. However, today is not that day. So, in short, the problem is that subsidies are aimed at large-scale intensive monoculture farming to the detriment of smaller scale and more diversified farms. It's promoting the opposite of a mosaic. So that is how we got to this landscape. So now let's look at our project area, which is here, near Bečko in Slovakia. This place here is a great visual representation of the problem, as every centimeter of land around here is used for farming in huge collectivized Soviet-style fields that are now subsidized by poorly thought through EU subsidies. But there is still this small hill here that isn't suitable for industrial farming. And this is where Broz, our amazing Slovak partners, have a plan to create a micro reserve for pollinating butterflies, moths, bees, and their host plants. The plan has two main components that should feel familiar to you by now. Reducing the woody vegetation by getting rid of the artificially introduced pines and the non-native acacia, and introducing conservation grazing to 20 hectares in order to improve grassland biodiversity. 
We supported Bros with 21,000 euros for this phase of the project. And by the time that I visited in April 2023, most of the woody vegetation was already cut, so I couldn't get a proper before shot for them. However, by the amount of acacia stumps, I think you get the picture here. It's been really cool to see the areas where the acacias have been removed. I mean, it's not beautiful, but I'm excited for what this is going to look like later. And yeah, now the ball is in nature's court and we wait for spring. And the goats came, the meadows flourished, and the butterflies boomed. But as I can't be everywhere at the same time, I decided to wait another year to show you this project in its second spring. So now, in 2024, I'm really excited to introduce you to the Expos. It's a uh, mixed group of uh, goats and also sheep because they have different uh, grazing behaviors. And that's really important to make sure that we also diversify the way that the plants are, uh, are grazed. And as you can see, they have a, have a good uh, team dynamic uh, going on. They're, uh, they're good friends. Different animals graze and browse differently. Sheep are more like lawnmowers and keep the ground vegetation short in height, while goats are fond of browsing shrubs and are also more nimble and capable of reaching harder to reach areas. In the future, bros might also want to add a donkey to the mix as they are more capable of keeping woody succession at bay. So here we have those uh, invasive plants after the, the goats have hit them. And as you can see here, they have essentially been uh, cutting the tops off, which is um, a really good way to, to slowly make a dent on the, um, the seed bank. So if, if the goats are eating the tops of the plants all the time, there'll be less seeds going into the ground and year by year, the, the seed bank will disappear. So it's a it's a really good way to, to try to get rid of these invasives for good or at least really suppress them so that their presence isn't affecting other species. The herd also comes with another benefit to a healthy meadow because, um, to quote Bros here, shit matters. And to make sure all the goat poo is healthy, Bros administers all the parasite medicine in winter when the goats are not out in nature. This means that during the spring and summer, when they're out at the meadows, the poo is in great condition to be used by all sorts of creatures, such as these dung beetles who are trying to roll it back to their underground nest to lay eggs on the dung. Newpy, Newpy, please, not my backpack, you bastard. Newpy! You gotta be held back. That's Bethel. That's the Bethel. <laughs> <laughs> Yubi, all right, chill, man. <laughs> what is your problem, huh? So as you can see, goats are stubborn creatures that go through great lengths to get what they want, which is why we need fences, both to keep them in and sometimes to keep them out. And that is why we are supporting bros with 7,000 euros to cover the materials and the general grazing infrastructure to uh, hold the likes of Newpy back a bit. So here behind this fence, we are uh, protecting a plant called Aristolochia clematitis. And it's actually a pretty special plant that also serves a particular butterfly called Zerithia polyxena. But we don't have this butterfly here yet. It's actually been found two kilometers away. So. Part of this is also to try to create a new place for, for these butterflies to go. So that's why this plant is currently being protected, protected. but once it's stronger and once it spreads a bit more, we'll also let, let the grazers uh, in, in this area. But for now, it's really important to ensure that these ones multiply. So now I think it's about time that we go explore these meadows and see what kinds of butterflies we can find. But as we do so, I would just like to remind you that these meadows can only flourish because of the support of our Mossy Earth members who join us with a monthly subscription and make projects like this achievable. So if that sounds like something you would like to support, then please consider becoming a member at mossy.earth. For this butterfly hunt, I'll be going with Mishka from Bros and Lubo who is a walking encyclopedia of butterfly and plant knowledge. The first factor which can limit our search is the season. White butterflies can be expected earlier in the spring, during April and the start of May. My visit was at the end of May, and this seemed to be true because we only saw a single white butterfly called Pieris rapae, or small white, the first species for our list. 
Then a mix of blue butterfly species can be expected from the end of May through to September. And we saw loads of them, which we'll get into in a minute. And then a mix of brown butterfly species, which have a shorter season, can be expected from mid-June through to mid-August. And we were lucky and saw a few of them, which arrived early this year. As we walked these meadows, it became clear to me just how many of these butterflies are monophagous, meaning they depend on a single plant. We found the green underside blue, or Glacopsyche alexis, which lays its eggs exclusively on the young flowers of this species here, called crown vetch, or coronilla varia. We also found the black medic flower, or medicago lupulina, which is used by two butterflies we did not see this time, called eastern short-tailed blue, or Everes decoloratus, and short-tailed blue, Everes argiades. In the dry sunny slopes of this hill, we found white stonecrop, or sedum album, and orpine, Ilotelephium maximum, who are both used by the checkered blue butterfly, Scolitandidis orion, to lay its eggs. And while we did not find the butterfly, we did find the eggs, so it counts as a species for our list. As we walked further, it was clear that this place is managed for biodiversity. Emphasis on managed here. There is no pretense of trying to leave this as a fully wild place. Here on top of the hill we have a great example of this attempt to try to mimic the conditions of how it would have been maybe a hundred years ago. This is effectively a plowed field and of course it's a bit of a strange thing for us who work in rewilding to be, to be plowing fields but the idea here is just to try to create a mix of as many habitats as possible so that this can be sort of a repository of biodiversity. And uh, if, it, if it means plowing a field in a traditional way, then, then that is what will be done here. It's, um, it's trying to create that mix of conditions. And the butterflies just kept coming. We found the elegant small blue, or Cupido minimus, resting on a plant. We found the extravagant silver studded blue, or Plebeus argus, doing a bit of butterfly yoga to stretch its wings. We found a few individuals of the beautiful Adonis blue, Polymatus belargus, perched on various flowers. And then we saw Alcon blue, Malcolinea alcon, and we got lucky to see them breeding, and even see the female laying her eggs on a cross gentian, Gentiana cruciata a picky plant that likes bare soil but does not like the sun and requires three years of growth before it is ready to produce flowers for the Alcon Blue. This kind of pickiness is a death wish in our landscape these days, but this place with its mix management approach can create the unique conditions required for this. So here we have yet another part of the puzzle. Essentially this area was cut twice last year and the biomass was removed to essentially to reveal these uh, these sort of open patches here. And this allows new plants to, to settle, once again to just try to give opportunity to other species. In amongst all of this diversity of habitats, we also saw beetles, bees of course, and a variety of other insects. And then we started finding all the brown butterflies, such as this small heath, Cononympha pampilus, trying to figure out how this plant works and eventually managing to pollinate it, and its dazzling cousin, the pearly heath, Cononympha arcania. There was also a chestnut heath, Cononympha glycerion, taking a well-deserved rest after flying against the wind, and we even got to see a breeding pair of meadow browns, Maniola yurtina, near the plowed field. In total, we're helping improve around 20 hectares of this wonderful habitat, which might not sound like much, but for these species, it goes a really long way. And as we got near to the top of the hill, we got to see another part of the puzzle. These are open oak wood pastures, which are quite rare these days, and another important part of this mosaic. And on top of the hill, as we got close to some flowers, we stumbled upon another beautiful species of butterfly, the Idas blue, or Plebeus Idas. And it was quickly joined by an Alcon blue and a small heath. I think I understand now why butterflies fit so well in Van Gogh's paintings. They are a relatively common sight, and, and so is a meadow, and, and especially back in his day, they used to be really common. But somehow, once you pay attention to these common sights, you can reveal the ecstatic beauty to be found in what would otherwise just be a boring old patch of grass on a hill. I'm super pleased to see the results of 
of this project. And uh, it's so much fun just walking around, poking like in between all the grasses, looking at the flowers and finding all the butterflies and then having Lubo explain their stories, their names and, and how they interact with their environment. It's uh, such a fascinating habitat right under our noses. And I hope that this video has made you enjoy meadows a bit more. It certainly has changed my perspective on them. I knew they were important, but now I can feel how they are important. And, and that is a, a big deal. And yeah, this meadow was only possible because of our Mossy Earth members. Uh, so if you'd like to support our work, support projects like this one here, then please consider, consider becoming a member at mossy.earth. It's pretty cheap to join and when we put it all together, when we put the contributions of everyone together, we can actually do really big things. It's uh, this sort of rewilding by the people, people like you and me, for the people that will benefit from these meadows in the future. So a big thank you to everyone who enables this work. Until next time. Cheers. <laughs>